Welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast of the Week starting Sunday, September 8th. I'm Mark Sponsler and I'll be your host for tonight's presentation. We'll be discussing jet stream level winds, surface level pressure, significant wave heights, and of course long-term uh, indicators like the MJO and of course El Nino. As usual, we'll start at looking at jet stream level winds over the South Pacific Ocean. Why the South Pacific Ocean? Well, there's not a whole lot going on in the North Pacific yet. We're in that transition. It seems a little bit later than usual and that's just kind of the way it is. We have not had any real significant activity in the North Pacific yet. Yeah, one small swell, but that was about it. So we'll focus on where there is activity, and there certainly is swell uh, swells radiating north. Hawaii's already gotten a pretty good push of swell and more on the way, and, so, and uh, California is just starting to get some of that. So here we go, jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales, and when those gales do form, uh, the jet stream helps direct their track. We're looking for a trough and we don't see anything that even closely resembles a trough. A trough would be, so here's the northern branch of the jet, here's the southern branch. A trough would be a push to the north in the southern branch here, and we don't see that at all. What we see is the southern branch running zonally down at about, what was it, about 65 south, the whole way across the South Pacific Ocean. I mean, there's Australia, there's New Zealand, South America. The swell window is pretty much south of New Zealand to somewhere over here for, uh, California and even further more like over here for Hawaii and what we have is a zonal pattern the jet is way to the south the Antarctic ice line is somewhere ranging between 65 south and 62 south if the jet is over that or south of that then there's literally no support for storm formation not over Antarctic ice and you have to have winds blowing over ice free waters to get any swell all right, so let's just put this in motion. We won't belabor the point. You see, there's almost something that's trying to look like a trough. And of course, a trough in the upper level there helps create low pressure in the upper level and down at the surface. And of course, low pressure generates wind. Winds generate seas. Seas as they radiate away from the fetch area, preferably pushing to the north, turn into swell. And swell, when it hits your beach, turns into surf. So little tiny trough with no wind pushing up into it on Tuesday. We're pretty much just ignoring that, waiting, looking for something more significant as as we get into like Thursday here. Yeah, another thing that kind of looks like a trough is, is going, but the apex of the trough is really like right here, and that's barely free of Antarctic ice in that area, so real, no real help there. Now you get this kind of trough here and trough there sort of thing as we get into Friday night. Maybe some activity here in the Tasman Sea. It's, the models have been hinting at this for a while now. It's not really clear. And you get the sense that the jet in general is going to start lifting north uh, Sunday, a week out, Sunday 12Z. So that's what, about 5 a.m. California time. And we'll just see there's 180 hours out. There's a bit of a trough, but winds right there are what, 90 knots. That's just not doing a lot. I mean, you really need at least 110 knot winds pushing to the northeast, uh, feeding the trough to get uh, some uh, storm development, and we're not really seeing it. So no real hope in the or help in the upper atmosphere for the coming week. Let's go take a look down at the surface. Here we are, surface level pressure, surface level winds. We see sort of a cutoff gale here, southeast of New Zealand with 40 knot winds sort of pushing to the north. Let's see what they do. They can, so this is like basically a cutoff trough or cutoff low because the jet's all down here. So there's no jet stream support in this low. 35 knot winds into Monday. Maybe you get a little bit of seas and that would certainly produce because Tahiti, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Tahiti is so close. Yeah, they could get some swell from that. Hawaii, California, probably not so much. I mean, that's still 5,000 nautical miles away from California. So probably not a whole lot of help there. And you see all that pattern just dissipates. We're looking for, there's 35 knot winds, but they're aimed due south at Antarctica. We really need 40 to 45 knot winds. We're not seeing it. There's 30 knot winds. And we're, we're already out to Friday here. Just looking, there's a little tiny gale forecast. Let's go back. That starts like Saturday night with, uh, for 50, 55 knot winds, but over a very small area. So, if, you know, if you want to use the analogy of swells are like dropping a boulder in a pond and watching the, uh, uh, the, the waves radiate out from it, this is like a pebble in a pond. 
not a whole lot expected. You need a larger fetch area, but maybe there's some hope there. And here we are a week out and still no hope in sight. Let's go take a look at the wave models. Now we're going to go back in time. This is Sunday a week ago. Okay, there's small southern hemi swell. Look at the buoys if you're in California. If you're in Hawaii, you already know you got your share on, what was that, Friday and Saturday? Pretty, pretty nice size. Four or five foot Hawaiian, uh, swell, uh, hit, hit the islands there. That same swell is starting to hit California. Not huge, you know, head high or something on the peaks, the biggest sets. Not, not a whole lot. Anyway, there was a series of storms that passed under New Zealand. Very small ones. See, storm number, this is number two number three and number four and this was a week ago um it was the fourth one in the series that uh probably has the best hope of any of them so sunday a week ago it started building it produced was at 41 foot seas into sunday 43 foot seas sunday evening and then lifted pretty well to the northeast now most of this was shattered by tahiti relative to uh um the u.s west coast for hawaii uh, no, not shadowed, but I think most of that swell has already hit. Anyway, you see it made it the whole way across, pretty much a good way across the Pacific before it faded on Wednesday. This swell expected to arrive into California Tuesday, Wednesday time frame. I mean, so for California, swell is expected to continue for, you know, pretty much most of the coming work week. Nothing huge. Nothing super consistent, but rideable southern hemi surf, and we'll take whatever we can get. It's better in wind swell, and since there's nothing really going on in the North Pacific, we'll take it. All right, let's go to the forecast now. Here we are, significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean. Also, notice the ice line here was at about 62 south under New Zealand, creeping its way down to about 63 south, maybe, when you get south, yeah, 140 west. And finally, on the very edge of the Southern California swell wind, it goes down to about 65 south. Anyway, that just means that there's not a lot of room or not nearly as much room under New Zealand as there is earlier in the year when the, the uh, ice line's down around 65 south. But it's winter down there now, so we're at the full extent, the full northern extent of ice development for, this, uh, for the season. All right, so we're looking. There's that little low we saw off of New Zealand. What's that produce? 27-foot you know, seas, something like that, over a tiny area. Then you see there's a lot of activity under southern Australia to Tasmania, but it doesn't make it much past the Tasman Sea, which would be right in this area, and then it fades out. You really want your storms to be at least make it over into this area here. Well, for Hawaii, for sure. Yeah, you can get swell up the Tasman Sea, but it's pretty well filtered by Fiji. And uh, the better window is here pushing to the north, both for California and for Hawaii. All right, so we're looking for 30-foot seas pushing under uh, New Zealand, which would be the infamous purple blob. We're looking, we're looking, we're looking. We're into Sunday a week ago, and hey, there we go. The models say about a week out little tiny thing in the central south pacific something pushing under new zealand not particularly huge whoops not particularly huge not aimed particularly well to the northeast but hey a little bit of hope a week out okay we'll take it given that the north pacific is not doing a whole lot but to believe a model a week out is a fool's errand so we're not particularly uh uh believe that this will happen at all all right let's continue so let's take a quick look at the North Pacific Ocean, all right, and specifically the jet stream, okay? We did it for the Southern Hemi, we'll do it for the Northern Hemi. The point being here, the jet stream, pretty, we like to see it somewhere between 45 and 40 north, and yeah, it sort of almost looks like it, and we're lo the troughs are pushing south here, right? Okay, so we're looking for a trough, there's a little trough, maybe Monday, Tuesday into the Gulf, and then what do we have? The jet pretty well to the north, running up around 50 north. Doesn't provide much exposure at all. I mean, this just gives you a sense there's a lot of high pressure right in here. We're into Saturday already. No real signs of anything. We're into Sunday. There's a little trough, maybe. Maybe, but that doesn't even look good. I mean, the whole northern hemi jet stream is displaced pretty far to the north that sort of smells of either la nina it certainly doesn't smell of el nino at all so there's no real upper level support for gale development 
in the North Pacific for the coming week, hence the focus on the Southern Hemisphere. We're just going to cut right to the chase here. We'll go over to the wave models. Let's roll this out. There is a small gale forecast. You can see it right here on Tuesday. Gets eh, 20, maybe 21 foot seas. There you go, 22 foot seas Tuesday night. Uh, aim pretty well at the Pacific Northwest, maybe down into Central California, we'll say. Uh, maybe 13 second period swell, pretty small. And that gale fades out. And then you kind of get what the tone will be from looking at the jet stream. Here was the uh, remnants of Juliet just kind of muddling along there, not really doing anything. I mean, there is tropical activity over here in the West Pacific, but because the jet stream is so far north, none of it gets caught by the jet stream. None of it recurves. None of it gets the opportunity to tap jet stream level energy and go extra tropical. That is typically what you would see early season in an El Nino year, specifically a strong El Nino year, but we're not seeing that at all. So then let's go take a look at the potential for uh, generating wind swell. See a bit of fetch here. Uh, Sunday, 18Z, that's 11 o'clock this morning. Uh, we had some low pressure over British Columbia, high pressure, 1032 millibars in the Gulf, creates a little bit of a gradient, a tightening of the isobars, creates northwest wind. Let's see what that does. That fetch holds into Monday, and we get some local fetch here along uh, the California coast. I mean, it's kind of a windy, ugly mess out there right now and has been for a while. There's been some upwelling water temperatures down in uh, central California. Uh, Hawaii, yeah, there's some east winds, but nothing to really generate wind swell at the moment. We're into Tuesday morning now. Now, here comes our low pressure system. You see up to 40 knot winds over a small area. Wind swell wise off of California, there's wind, but probably not enough to generate wind swell, but maybe maybe a little bit in the water from day previous fetch. Hawaii, nothing there. We're watching our low. As we get into Wednesday, it kind of starts fading out. Uh, again, weak 15 knot winds off the central and north California coast. Not, yeah, maybe some wind swell, but nothing much. Uh, that gradient builds a little bit come Thursday. 20 knot winds off of uh, Point Arena or so, but not in earnest. Yeah, steady, junky wind swell at exposed breaks, maybe down to Point Conception, but nothing, nothing to write home about. Watching Hawaii here, Juliet, yeah, maybe it'll make some swell. Probably not a whole lot, because, I mean, the main activity looks, you see the winds there, they're out of the east, and the center of Juliet, or what was Juliet, is northeast by a good margin. What is that? Uh, about 600 miles northeast of the island, so that's probably not going to push any swell in there. Maybe a little bit, hard to say. And then we get, as we get into next weekend, building gradient, 20, 25 knot north winds. Sure, that'll make wind swell, and wind's not blowing too hard along the coast, and that even sets up a little bit more into Sunday with 30 knot winds. Now, here we go. This is something new. Uh, what do we have? Oh, the 18Z run of the model. Okay, so instantly, boom, uh, 30, 35 knot winds building. Let's see. Oh, there we go. And uh, we're into Sunday night, 45 knot winds. Now, again, this is a week out. Do you believe it? I don't. Not even close. But, hey, maybe there's hope there. We'll see. And, of course, wind swell into California. So, for next weekend, wind swell, the southern hemi swell will be gone. Maybe a developing gale in the northern Gulf of Alaska. Um, and maybe some wind swell from Juliet down into the Hawaiian Islands. So, hey, maybe there's hope. Not so bad. All right, let's go take a look long-term. What's going on with the Madden-Julian Oscillation? And, of course, El Nino or La Nina or, well, we don't know. I guess we're going to see. As usual, we like to start off looking at winds in what we call the Kelvin Wave Generation Area. That's a fancy word for the West Pacific. That's where, when you have the active phase of the MJO, so here's the West Pacific here, here's the East Pacific, here's the equator. Kelvin Wave Generation Area, 5 degrees north and south of the equator, from the dateline, there's 180 west, so it's just a little bit east of there, 170 west, 5 degrees north and south, the whole way over to as far west in the West Pacific as you can go, 134, 135 west. So draw a box in your mind there. When you see westerly winds or westerly anomalies in that area, then you can get a Kelvin wave, and if you have enough active phases in a row, and it takes, the active phase of the MJ is a slow-moving thing, it takes like three or four weeks to go from the West Pacific to the East Pacific, and you have active phase, 
then the inactive phase will go by, then the active phase will go by. But if you get successive active phases and they're strong enough, they produce enough westerly wind anomalies, that, and there's warm water over here, um, then you can get El Nino. And of course, El Nino is good for amplifying the jet stream, and the active phase of the, jet, of the MJO is good for imparting energy to the jet stream as well. So the short of it is anything that feeds the jet stream in the north of the South Pacific, Pacific helps to support storm formation, and that's what that's why we're very obsessed about always looking for the active phase of the MJO or El Nino. All right, so today's situation, this uh, well, wind sensors from the TAO buoy array, these are not real-time winds, they're five-day average winds. That's good for good enough for being able to monitor uh, the MJO. East winds, you can see them, look at the arrows there, the whole way across the Pacific, even to almost into the Kelvin wave generation area, and then dying. Okay, anomalies. That's what really matters. Though. The difference from normal for this time of year. Yeah, those east winds, look at the size of those arrows. They look like they're blowing pretty hard. But you take a look at this, and the, the arrow sizes on this chart are very small, meaning those are pretty much normal winds. Normal winds over the equatorial region near the dateline. Then when you get into the Kelvin wave generation area, because the easterly winds are so weak, and there's even a little bit of westerly wind, you have a weak westerly wind tendency over the Kelvin wave generation area. So, hey, maybe the active phase of the MJO, not particularly strong, but it looks like it. Let's go take a look at the forecast. Here we are, zonal wind anomalies for the entire, this is the entire planet. We don't care about anywhere but uh, two deg uh, five degrees north and south of the equator. That's where this is, so that's good. Equatorial winds, and only in the Pacific, and the Pacific goes from 135 east, so about there to way over to here, but of that, the Kelvin wave generation area is just from there to about there. So this little area going right up the chart, and this is past performance here. Reds are westerly anomalies. So you see we had some westerly anomalies in eh, mid-August. Mid but where we are right now is a pretty good, almost like a westerly windburst, and go, hey, that's the active phase of the MJO, and certainly it is. And, hey, that's almost a westerly windburst, and, hey, that would be a good thing for maybe making a Kelvin wave. Uh, but you, you need the winds. You also need warm water over there, too, and we suspect there's not as much warm water as we'd like, and this westerly windburst is not as big, long-lasting, or uh, as strong as one would like, but beggars can't be choosy. This looks better than nothing. We'll take it, and the good news is it's supposed to hold for the next five days, but then it decays, but certainly no easterly anomalies. See those blues here? but they're not in the Kelvin wave generation area. It is this area right in here that is key to everything for the Pacific. So this is not a horribly bad pattern. Maybe this will help, you know, feed that gale that we saw on the forecast charts in the Gulf and the other one that's supposed to develop on Tuesday. All those could be indirectly related to this batch of westerly anomalies setting up in the Kelvin wave generation area. So we've just been theorizing that the active phase of the MGO is going on, but here is the actual uh, an MGO related anomalies from the statistical model. Another way, of, a fancy way of saying, hey, we're, what's the MGO actually doing? Blues are the active phase, yellow the inactive phase. Blues meaning this. Is, so this is outgoing long wave radiation, sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface. If you have blues, you have negative anomalies. See the negative numbers. That means. There's a lot of clouds in the atmosphere. That's like low pressure. That is the hallmark of the active phase, the MJO, which is good. So active phase, the MJO, in control for the statistic model, supposed to hang for the next five days, then go neutral about eight days out, and then maybe turn lightly towards the inactive phase. Now that's just one model. Another model says, the uh, dynamic model says, active phase holding a little bit longer, but not very strong, holding out, you know, a week and a half, and then at the second week, it dies to neutral. I like this better than the statistic model because there's no hint of the inactive phase, so we'll take it. But this, what this also suggests is if there was a window for storm development, it's in the next week and a half. And the models seem to correlate pretty well to that, so that means this picture is tying together pretty well. So how strong is the MJO? Well, we suspect it's pretty weak just by looking at the two uh, sets of models we looked at so far. These phase diagram charts are a way of confirming that theory. So how do you read this? Assume this circle here is the North Pole. You're looking down on the North Pole, and the MJO travels from west to east over the Indian Ocean, 
through the maritime continent, that's like Bali, over the West Pacific, across the Dateline, through the East Pacific, under the United States, this is only on the equator, across the Gulf of Mexico, across the Atlantic Ocean, across North Africa, back to the Indian Ocean, round and round the MJ goes, both active, if the active was here, the inactive would be on the other side of the planet, pretty much. All right, the heavy dot is where the active phase is right now. The further it is, so if the dot is in the circle, the MJ is considered to be extremely weak. Well, here's the heavy dot. It's, yeah, just entering the West Pacific and extremely weak. And these are the three different tracks. It's supposed to basically collapse per the statistic model and ease its way off to the east somewhere in the Atlantic two weeks out. The dynamic model, a little bit more favorable, saying, yeah, the active phase is, is weak. It's supposed to build a little for the next two or three days, then collapse. But not travel off to the east as fast and just sort of hang linger weekly in the west pacific i like that uh, scenario a lot better than i like this scenario here's the upper level model we assume this to be a statistic model just by watching it a whole lot now this is looking even better where so uh there's south america there's the equator datelines right about there australia uh maritime continent right there bali like right in there the greens are areas favorable for precipitation. One can assume that to be the active phase of the MJO. And this has amplified significantly from even yesterday, and that was better than the day before that. A moderately strong active phase of the MJO indicated per the uh, this model. And each one of these frames is five days. So that's the 8th. There's the 13th. There's the uh, the 18th. You get it. The active phase weakening, moving off, and moving over Central America on October 3rd. So that's pretty much when the North Pacific will probably go to sleep. The active phase, or the inactive phase, the MJO starts building the far West Pacific about the end of September. And it takes over running the whole way through and putting, pushing into Central America about mid to late October with a weak active phase following that. So just eyeballing this, we say, okay, September, probably the first three weeks of September look pretty good for swell development, and that's kind of what we saw on all the other data. Then things sort of fall apart, and things don't wake up again until maybe mid to late October, Halloween time frame, something like that. All right, let's keep going. All right, the short-term CFS model. This is a good one. This one goes out like three months. Uh, 850 millibar wind anomalies, that's winds up at about 4,700 feet. This is the whole planet on one chart again, Kelvin wave generation area between, right between here and here going up. You can see, again, back in July, the reds are westerly anomalies. The solid, uh, let's see, the MJO is a black contour, so right there. Now we had a weak active phase of the MJO in July with westerly anomalies. What was the result? We had surf the entire month of July, southern hemi swell. And then right at the end of July, all the westerly anomalies died. And there's your weak inactive phase. The swell uh, you know, pattern fell apart. And then late August into early September, well, it looks like the, doesn't look like the active phase is developing, but you see building westerly anomalies, a whole series of tropical systems. And... Lo and behold, we have swell in the water. So that's why we follow the MJO. There's a good correlation. It's not even the MJO. It's westerly anomalies in the Kelvin wave generation area. Feeds the jet stream, and that creates storms, and that creates surf. You got it. All right. So September 7th and the 8th and the 9th, the next couple of days, pretty solid westerly anomalies forecast. But the good news here is look at this. The whole way through into, uh, into October 5th, westerly and gentle Westerly anomalies are forecast in the Kelvin wave generation. Now, not an area, not as strong as that, but certainly not easterly anomalies. And that bodes well for storm development as we transition into fall. And the greater correlation between westerly anomalies in the Kelvin wave generation area and storm development is in the northern hemisphere in the Gulf of Alaska and the North Dateline region. So this suggests that the transition to fall, at least, will be coming, and it should be meh, modest to, you know, it should wake up sometime in the next month. That's, but you go, well, of course, it's the seasons. Why wouldn't it?
and to write. And then finally, the three-month CFS model. And if you've been following us for the past couple of weeks, you know we've been kind of fretting here because this model is consistently telling a story that is directly contradictory to what the ocean is telling us. And yes, we are in a sort of transition state. You're in, you know, we're still basically in summer and we're moving to fall and we're trying to get a bead on what's going on, what's going to happen this winter. This model is very favorable for what's going to go on this winter, but the ocean doesn't seem to support what the model's saying. So let's look at the model. All right. So the same deal. Uh, but times are reversed. Past, uh, the past, May, June, July, August is all down here. And you can see, not a particularly strong pattern. The Kelvin wave generation area between these two tick marks going up. You see not a western general westerly winds. But then you look up here and you go, wow, this looks pretty solid. I mean, pretty solid westerly anomalies, especially as we get into November and December. Of course, I don't believe a model three months out, but I'm kind of desperate. and I'll take whatever I can get. All right, so let's overlay the MJ. What's going on here? Now, here's where the the mixed bag begins. You go, okay. Westerly anomalies looking good, building the whole way into fall. The MJO should be waking up, powering it. What do we see? The weakest, most anemic MJO signal you could ever imagine, which is true. That is exactly what's happening. Here, we're supposed to be moving into the active phase of the MJO for the next, eh, into the end of September. Kelvin wave generation area cuts off right here. So it's, you know, from now to, let's say, October 1st. Then we go into this weak inact the dotted contours or the inactive phase with you know just sort of a mixed very weak pattern and then even when you get into a little bit stronger pattern in late in thanksgiving into towards december still very weak mjo pattern you know that that kind of doesn't make sense now here's what we were talking about last week and the week before and that this is the good news area boom the low pass filter all right so this is basically delineating an area of low pressure sort of like an el nino this is what el nino looks like right we had two contour lines back in may it died and this model a while ago was saying that this low pressure bias is supposed to completely disappear and move to the indian ocean that would have been la nina but now i mean the model is just doubling down if not tripling down saying we're going back to two contours and it was saying it like late october now we're talking like October 16th. Then we're moving to three contours in like right before Thanksgiving. And that's where the westerly anomalies are coming from is this, the model sense that low pressure bias is going to build in the Pacific. High pressure, the dotted contour here, builds in the Indian Ocean. This is more like El Nino than La Nina. So then you start going, hmm, what's going on here? And we've been sort of saying, well, maybe we're moving towards the uh, warm phase of the PDO. And we don't talk about the PDO a whole lot, but that's like a super long-term, you know, El Nino, La Nina thing. It's a weather pattern that sets up that the warm phase is like El Nino, but it lasts for 15 or 20 years. And the cold phase of the PDO is like La Nina, and it lasts for 15 or 20 years, too. And what this sort of supports, we've been thinking that since, when was it, uh, 2014 when we went into El Nino there, that maybe that was the tipping point. Now we're moving from the cold phase of the PDO. And the cold phase of the PDO started uh, when the big super El Nino of 1997-98 uh, faded out. And we've been in the cool phase for like 15 or so years. We're thinking maybe we're moving towards the warm phase now. This sort of supports that theory. But, you know, it's hard to know too far in advance. Certainly don't want to take it to the bank. Don't want to start waving the flag and say, yeah, we're moving into the warm phase of the PDO. But we've been kind of hinting that maybe that's where we're going. And the data is the model again. But if we get into this sort of scenario come the fall, that would be really good news. And I'll show you why when we start looking at surface temperature data. And by surface temperature, I mean ocean surface temperature data. But we're going to start subsurface data, all right? This is the West Pacific here, East Pacific here. Uh, this data from the TAO buoy array, series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. These are the anchor lines on the buoys the whole way across the equator in the Pacific Ocean. The X's are the sensors on those anchor lines. 
they collect data, they relay it via satellite up to, I think it's Washington, Maryland, something like that. Uh, they use a model to connect all the data together, build a picture. So what you see, 30 degree isotherm right here, that's 30 degrees centigrade. That's warm water, not super warm, but it's warm. But it was over at 180 a week or a week and a half ago. It's retrograded to about 176 east. The uh, 29 degree isotherm was at 170. It's re retrogated to 175. The uh, 28 degree isotherm was at 160, and it had retrogated from over here way somewhere. It's back to, we'll say, about 162 or 163 west. The uh, 24 degree isotherm is at 120, and it's been hovering around there. What it suggests is warm water is in the west, but there's a, a thin, so this line, the past winter, was going the whole way into Ecuador. It's retreated. Cool water is setting up here in the East Pacific. And that's why we're scratching our head, right? We're looking at uh, that previous model saying, hey, low pressure bias building in the, you know, over the date line, Kelvin wave generation area. Looks like El Nino is rebuilding, but the ocean's going, no, there's no El Nino here, and there's no signs of it even looking remotely like El Nino. And that's the theme. We're going to go look at a couple of charts here and uh, so try to support that thesis, all right, or that theory. So uh, anomalies, differences from normal for this time of year. If we were in El Nino, there'd be a lot of warm water over here in the East Pacific. There isn't. We have what looks like a Kelvin wave trying to develop with two degree centigrade anomalies under the date line, but it's been sitting here for weeks, making literally 150 is the cutoff, 150 west. It hasn't moved one inch east of there in weeks, and we don't think it's going to, because you need strong west anomalies to get all this water moving off to the east. And we think, if anything, we've got east anomalies going over in this area, or at least cold water. What's that? Two, three degrees below normal. This had backed off to about one degree below normal last week. Now it's building again. You get this sense that there's just this perpetual cool pool trying to evolve here. And that's what La Nina looks like when you have warm water all in the West Pacific and cool water in the East Pacific. Um, we do have a little bit of warm water on the surface, but it's pretty much just neutral. So we're not La Nina, but we're certainly not El Nino either. We're like in just not a land, somewhere in between. Madoki, El Nino, not even that. No, just dead neutral. And the upper ocean, this is really subsurface, down 300 meters, temperature trend for the past year. So here's what a Kelvin wave looks like. Warm water, so this is the West Pacific here. East Pacific here, when you get the active phase of the MJO, when you get westerly anomalies blowing on the ocean surface going in this direction, you take warm water that was here and it starts moving off to the east. That's called a Kelvin wave, right? And then it eventually impacts the coast of Ecuador and uh, blooms and creates a pool of warm water off in the East Pacific, all right? Well, that was a year ago, and we had another Kelvin wave in January this year weaker, actually more concentrated, but not as broad, less warming over in this area, and then boom, 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 three like mini Kelvin waves. Here's the latest one that's trying to form, but they notice they don't even make it to Ecuador. They don't see like it impacts there, it impacts there. This stalls at 120 west, so that'd be on the equator south of California. This one stalls basically south of Y. This one is stalled on the date line. You just get the sense that this Kelvin wave pattern, though it's still trying to happen, there's just not enough warm water here. The westerly winds aren't strong enough. There's just not enough support to really get anything going. And that smells of a fading El Nino type of pattern. So again, when we're scratching our head going, the model's saying El Nino is coming this winter or something that very much looks like it. We're going, well, at the ocean, at least subsurface-wise, we're not seeing any evidence. And if there was El Nino coming or even a weak El Nino, you would already be seeing it. There should be Kelvin waves pushing off to the east. They're trying, but they're not getting there. So we're kind of calling hokey on all this for right now. And upper ocean heat anomaly just... Over uh, for the past year, amount of, here's another way of looking at the volume of warm water. There's all warm water between the date line and 100 west. You see it's just, and each one of these is like Kelvin wave, Kelvin wave, weaker Kelvin wave, weaker Kelvin wave. And, you know, 
there's not a lot of warm water in the central to east Pacific anymore. So let's get, go take a look at surface level temperatures, all right? And this is really what matters because it's the temperature of the ocean's surface. That's where evaporation occurs, right? When you have evaporation, that feeds energy into the atmosphere. The more energy that's going into the atmosphere, heat energy specifically, then that's what feeds the jet stream, that feeds the storm track. So off of Chile, off of Peru, cool water, cooler than normal water. Not iceberg cold, certainly not la nina but sort of looking more like normal temperatures then you see this so and trades along here blow up out of the south there's like high pressure so high pressure uh circulates counterclockwise in the south pacific so you get upwelling here and then it takes that cool water and drives it to the west along the equator and you can see there's this steady carved out stream if there was El Nino, this would all see the warm temperatures up here now. It's it's only five degrees north and south of the equator that really matters. All the rest of this looks impressive, but it's more like blow off from the previous El Nino. Okay, so you see, yeah, there's little pockets of warm water, but still five degrees north and south of the equator from the official El Nino monitoring region, 120 west, five degrees north and south out to 170 right in here. See cool water in the majority of, of that area and it's coming from here off of Ecuador and Peru and being carried by trades that are a little bit stronger than normal than not so we don't see any signs of El Nino at the surface there let's go look at the trend All right so here's the uh, seven day trend so last week where you have reds that's warming this is good news we've actually had this this area is closing off a bit it was uh, cool going the whole way out here two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Now the trend is temperatures are warming here. They're warming off of Peru. This is good news. Maybe, maybe the model has a little bit of handle on something that we're not seeing. Or maybe this trend is just very short-lived. It's hard to say. Last week we went and sort of looked at, okay, years similar to this year, uh, you know, and how did things work out? We'll get into that in a minute. We're not actually going to do the whole thing. But for right now, the trend is warming here off around the Galapagos and out to a point yeah, south of Mexico, but still cooling in other pockets. It's this interspersed kind of pattern that's neither El Nino, neither La Nina, and at this time of year it should be trending one way or the other if El Nino or La Nina is going to develop. What we're seeing is just kind of a mixed bag, at least in the weekly trend. Now here's the overview. Actual sea, well, sea surface temperature anomalies, differences from normal for this time of year. We talked about this last year. We have cooling that developed. Basically, this looks like the start of La Nina. Com not only, uh, so the Kelvin wave generation area is over here. The official El Nino monitoring region is here. You see definitely cooler waters in there. But these waters typically originate off of here and, and are driven by trades in this area. What we see is a weak temporary, temporary warming trend right in here. And maybe the thought is that this warming trend will manifest itself and work its way over into here a month or two out. Um, or at least shut it down and prevent the formation of, it, of La Nina. But just looking at this, if I were to see this and go, hey, this looks like La Nina is going to develop this winter. The model says no. Historically speaking, more often than not, when you have this sort of a pattern, you end up in La Nina. The model says no. And that's the head scratcher. And that's what may, if, if it doesn't develop and we just sort of fall into a neutral pattern, um, then one could say that would be an argument for the warm phase of the PDO. And we've discussed this a little bit uh, last week on, you know, in comments on the video about, well, are we moving to La Nina? Is it the warm phase of the PDO? The short of it is, we don't know. You can look at the historical record. Uh, the historical record supports cool water. When you have a pattern like this, it typically gets cold. But if the warm phase is developing, maybe not. So this will be an indicator. This will give an insight of what's going to happen. We're what, five years into what might be a 15-year warm phase of the PDO, and I'm still sort of scratching my head. The index, We'll look at the indexes maybe here if we get a chance. Uh, but the jury's still out. That's the short of it. 
All right, so what's going on? Maybe the atmosphere can give us some clues. What's going on in the atmosphere, and are we moving towards El Nino? All right, so we look at the Southern Oscillation Index, difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, and Tahiti. When the index is negative, today it's minus 20.92, then that, and it stays negative for a while, and you kind of look and go, hey, look at this. We've got a pretty good long run, a week or two of uh, negative numbers. That will tell you whether you're in the active phase of the MJO. So we're doing pretty good. The 30-day average, that's a better indicator of where we're going in terms of active or inactive phase of the MGO. We went from basically neutral uh, two weeks ago to minus 7.8. So I'd say, yeah, we're certainly moving towards the active phase of the MGO. The 90-day average is your El Nino indicator. What's it doing? We're at minus 7.03. Um, well, just eyeball that. If you're in El Nino, you should be like at minus 15 or something. And what's the trend? We're going nowhere. It's basically unchanged from what it was a month ago. So we're not moving to La Nina, according to this index. That's very good news. We're not moving to El Nino. We're biased. We're neutral, biased, very, very weakly towards El Nino is what this suggests. That's not bad. I'll take that. That's way better than being in a raging La Nina or even neutral bias towards La Nina. So uh, this is not bad news. When we were looking at sea surface temperature data, I forgot to show the index. So let's show that because that gives you a little bit of sort of an indication of the trend too. This is the Nino 1.2 region, the re region right there along Peru and Ecuador. The trend today is pretty much unchanged from what it's been for the past five days. Uh, almost one degree below normal, 0.945. No big surprise when we look at the charts, we saw blue off of uh, Peru and Ecuador. So, but this is a noisy area. This is not the official El Nino monitoring region. This is the Nino 3.4 region from 120 west to 170 west. The trend, you can see it heading down. Yeah, today it's up a little bit, still a third of a degree below normal, 0.302 right there. It really, we went from warm in August, what's that, about August 10th or 9th, something like that, and boom, the bottom just dropped out. Now, if anything, we're trending weekly towards La Nina. So this is the issue. This has to rise up to normal or get a little bit above normal for us to say, yeah, maybe the warm phase of the PDO is a uh, is an influencer here. Or even if we're at minus two through the minus two tenths of a degree through the winter, that would still support the warm phase of the PDO theory. So here's where things get real interesting. This is the CFS model again. The sea surface temperature forecast for the Nino 3.4 region, the official El Nino monitoring region. And here's why we're scratching our head. I mean, I kind of get what the model's doing. But anyway, so here's September. Here's our negative sea surface temperature anomalies. Look what the model says. This model says temperature's increasing to eh, 0.4. 0.4, 4 tenths of a degree above normal, to a half a degree above normal as we get into December. That's like pushing towards El Nino region, but not holding long enough. And then as we get into the spring, down to you know, a quarter of a degree above normal. So basically, neutral but biased warm. Even if we got half of this, this would be a good thing. So I think what the, this model, again, is this is the one that's forecasting the, the low pressure bias on the date line, building the three contour lines this winter. It's also forecasting, you know, temperatures warming. Most of the other models, we looked at this maybe last week or the week before. This is a little bit on the high side, but all the models are saying, oh, two to three to maybe four tenths of a degree above normal through the winter. So this isn't too far of an outlier. So just for laughs, we're going to look at two PDO indices. Here's one of them. This is the more liberal of them. Here's the numbers when it's positive. This suggests the warm phase of the PDO. The short of it here is, here we go, 2019, January, February, March. You get it up to July. And all these say positive numbers, one. So weak tendency towards the warm phase of the PDO. That's the one we want. That's the one that's like a long-running El Nino. Then here's NOAA's official index. They, they account for some other things in the PDO and use a little bit different methodology. They're saying we were at negative a half, which is not much. Today, minus 0.10. So basically dead neutral. So you see one, one of the, one of the indices or one way of calculating the indices says, Hey, we're definitely going towards the warm phase of the PDO. This NOAA's version says neutral. Let's look at it graphically real quick. 
So just for laughs, here's a graphical representation of NOAA's official PDO index. You go back in the 50s, if you see blues, that's cold, that's negative. Even though you can have some warm spikes in here, here is, uh, you know, like 1948 into 1978. That was a 30-year run of the uh, cool phase of the PDO. And then we went into this run from, uh, was that, 78 to 98, the warm phase of the PDO. Now notice there's still a cool phase in there. And then in 98, we think we switched. Here was the cool phase of the PDO into 2014. Now here's where we are. Here was this big warm spike associated with a pretty good run of El Nino. And then here's the negative a little bit, but just right in here, can we blow it? Oh, okay, maybe we can. Nope, that's about all, all as much as we're going to do. You see, um, we were uh, trending towards, uh, right now we're trending slightly warmer, but you get this kind of warm, kind of negative. It, this is why we're saying we're not sure whether we're really in the warm phase or not, though we suspect we probably are, and the transition was right here. I mean, you don't go from that long of a cold run. There we go. That's what I was looking for. That long of a cold run and then get a big spike like this. And in the historical record, you don't see it either. So we suspect, and with uh, the oceans continually getting warmer, and we're not going to argue that debate here, but it's, it's pretty much a fact they are getting warmer. There's empirical data to support it. Um, that that would favor a more frequent warm phase of the PDO as well, because the PDO and El Nino and all that stuff, and the active phase of the MJO, and war summer and winter are all about venting heat out of the oceans and off the surface of the earth. It's about trying to maintain heat equ equilibrium balance on the face of the earth. So the hotter the oceans get, the more frequent you'd have warm phases of the PDO, the El Nino pattern, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how much of a difference that makes is completely unknown. That's just a working theory at this point in time. But anyway, here's the data. You can see it for yourself, and then we can talk about it on the forum if you like. So the short recap is there is southern hemi swell in the water. A uh, series of three three swells, four sw three swells. Yes, first is hitting southern California. The first and the second of and the third, for that matter, have pretty much passed Hawaii. There's still a building pattern expected for California through eh, about Wednesday or so, and then things will start slowly start fading off. North Pacific is trying to come online in fits and spurts. A little gale maybe Tuesday, maybe a little bit bigger gale in the northern Gulf come next weekend, and then we'll see where we go from there. Um, at some point, we're hoping the North Pacific will come online, the South Pacific might shut down, but for right now, the models are saying a week from now, maybe another small uh, system pushing under New Zealand with some swell resulting. So all that is pretty good. All right. So next week, we will not do a forecast. Uh, we're going to take a break for one week, but we'll do it the week after that. You all have uh, looked at the site. You uh, all Be sure to check out stormsurf.com. All this data is available there. You can go fish around, uh, do your own forecast. It's good to try it on your own. And then we'll be back the week after that. Um, let's see. We are on Instagram. We are on Facebook. Um, you can subscribe down. Uh, let's see if we can do this over there and down at the bottom. You can... Uh, uh, sign up, subscribe, and we'll uh, ring the bell. There's a little bell there. Click on that. You'll get notifications every time we do an update so you don't have to go digging around the site looking for it. But if you don't want to be notified, you're welcome to dig around the site. We have a banner at the top of the site that lets you know every time we update. And uh, so, okay, so that's it. I uh, hope you enjoyed the forecast, and we'll do this in two weeks. Thanks for watching.